I just want to take you back to some of the technicalities that is so important in this book. I tell my kids, you know, we must work smarter, not harder. And this little gray area in the notes are truly our um, way of working smarter. That is what we call the exam guideline. So apologies for the kids who've heard this before, but like I say, I'm assuming there's some children that maybe is only listening now for the first time. So yeah, humor me for this next few minutes. So what Mr. Green has done is he's taken out the exam guidelines for economics um, for each subdivision in the topic, and he clearly indicates what we need to know for each of the subdivisions in this um, topic. So guys, um, we can use this. If they just ask us to briefly describe, that is a maximum of two marks that they can ask us. So you and I, we have done topic one, where we spoke about the um, circular flow and all the players and injections and leakages. That was topic one. So now today we are going to do topic two, which is our business cycles. So if I can just quickly show you again, um, if this is um, paper one for the end of the year, paper one, it always consists of question one, which covers all the work. Question two, we can only cover topic one, two, three, and four. Question three, I'm gonna skip that because that's not what we're focusing on today. And question four is also again covering topic one, two, three, and four. And then we have our essay questions where you only choose one. You either do question five or question six. But if you decide to study topic one, two, three, and four, you will select, select question five as your essay question. So learners, again, this is so easy to get 30 out of 40 marks already for your essay question because in your exam guideline, you can clearly see when the guideline indicates. I just want to scroll down to a one of the possible long questions. I know here by the indicators. Here we go. So here by 2.4, as, as soon as it says discuss in detail, that means this is a possible long question. But now we know that this question was asked in 2021. So you don't have to study this as a essay type question. It can still be data response. It can still be your monkey puzzles, but this cannot be a essay question. So in chapter one, um, if I remember correctly, there is two possible long questions and you will see in this chapter, we have, let's just scroll down. Here we go. Discuss in detail. We have another possible long question or essay question for that matter. So learners, you can go and work this out beforehand as a possible essay and learn it like a parrot because this is one of the five possible questions you can get. And then you already have 30 out of 150. OK, but enough of that. that. So let's just quickly run through um, what is expected of you for the business cycle. So we said we need to, um, in your guidelines, it states that you briefly need to describe the concepts of the business cycle. So if you remember, sorry guys, I just want to scroll up. Oh, now I'm too far. Just scroll back to the notes. Uh, I'm not going to explain everything to you. I just want to quickly run and bring your mind back to um, business cycles. So this first part of the work is the definition, and you must know this definition. It will get asked. If it's a monkey puzzle for two marks or a column A, column B, or even at your data response, one of those define questions for two marks. And I tell my learners, I know a lot of you also have business studies as a subject, but don't let this word business cycle fool you. 
We're not busy with business studies. We are looking at the economy. So all the businesses and all the consumers and all the government co combined together. So if you want to split this into three parts, you can say a business cycle is the phenomenon of successive, so ne, continuous periods, ups and downs of what? Of businesses? No, of economic activity. And I think as soon as you know that, then they can't really catch you out in this work because we want to see, is it going well with our country? i.e. is our economics or is the e economy doing well or is the economy not performing well i.e. are we on a downturn so that is what we're going to look at so when you go through your notes this is the stuff we did since grade 10 where we look at our expansion phase and our contraction phase and then we move through the four periods and we if we have a full length business cycle it's from peak to peak or trial to trial and that line over there is the trend line so this is the stuff you and i've been doing like i said since grade 10. but guys don't again think about it we are currently at not a very good situation in south africa ne? so is unemployment high or is unemployment low? Well, I don't know from you guys, but I can see in my area, unemployment is high. People don't have jobs. I experience in my own life how I must budget more, how I think twice before I spend some money. And it's because our econ economy is in a downswing, a contraction. It is not going so well. Well, hopefully, maybe we can move into a recovery where growth will happen. So as soon as the economy grows, people tend to spend more money. Why? Because more people are now employed. If more people are employed, then companies, businesses need to produce more. If they produce more, then again, People need to be employed and it's a ripple effect where we continue to grow our economy. So that is how this upswing happens. So, OK, here we move through the phases, but this is not a possible long question, kids. So don't study it like one. Study this graph, draw it on a paper for you, stick it somewhere where you can see it and just so that you understand the concept. OK, moving on, moving on. And then this is just a real um, figure of what a um, business cycle, what it looks like in reality, because I mean, it's not the nice curvy one we just saw at the top. OK, then we move on at 2.2. This is the guideline again. They just want you to explain exogenous and endogenous. OK, so quickly. When I think of this, my brain goes to life sciences or natural science for that matter. Oh, and then the kids want to roll their eyes at me, ma'am, because we left that subject in grade nine already. OK, but think back um, when we spoke about exogenous in grade nine, NS or whenever it was, we referred to a crab. I don't know if you can recall that. But a crab has a skeleton on the outside and it's exogenous. So exogenous means outside. And then obviously the opposite is true, endogenous. That means inside. So these fluctuations that we see, this ups and downs in the economy, some people feel it is because of factors from the outside stuff that we have no control over some people feel no it is problems or issues or factors that comes from the inside so guys this exogenous these four four reasons from the outside they refer to things like natural disasters think about it guys um when we had a drought in in cape town um there was a scarcity 
for fresh food. There was a scarcity of fresh water and that um, created fluctuations in our economy. When we look at exogenous, it's also like the war that's going on in Russia right now. So the war is not between us. We've got nothing to do with it. But uh, Ukraine being the um, one of the biggest suppliers of wheat in the world is now going to cause a shortage in bread. That's definitely going to affect us. Maybe our bread producers will rather send our bread. They'll export it because they'll get more money. Or now there's a shortage of bread, so you and I might have to pay more for it. So it's all the factors from the outside. And then when we look at endogenous, there's actually just one. Um, one issue that causes this, and it's you and me, the consumer. And how do we affect it? By demanding more or demanding less? Think about it, guys. As soon as we demand more, we create a trend for something and we push up the price ourselves. But when we demand less, there's an oversupply or a surplus, if you want to call it. So then the price automatically drops. So we cause these fluctuations of up and down. So when we speak about endogenous reasons for the fluctuations, we refer to the market forces of demand and supply. OK, moving along and then we just ask you, yeah, you can must be able to compare the two with one another. Um, and then the last one is give different types of business cycles. So I just want to show you here in the notes. I, I told my kids um, this is something maybe when if I was in matric, I would be like, uh, maybe I don't want to study this. Can I tell you, please study this. They love to ask these little um, types of business cycles as your shorter, uh, shorter questions. So in your monkey puzzles, they'll maybe say, um, let's use this one. This business cycle um, is caused by changes in building and construction. And then they give you these four options and then you must know it's Kuznets. Or what they also have asked in the past, when you get to your section B questions, where you have your question 2.1.1, and they ask you list two types of business cycles. So this can definitely be tested as at least two marks. So don't miss this. OK. And here we are now. We basically starting, I think, with the um, almost grade 12 work. So when I think of a business cycle and we see those extreme ups and downs, I know that's bad. The government don't want that. The um, government cannot increase our tax, so spending will decrease. OK, so let's that's the one part of the fiscal policy. The other part is government spending. Think about it. So if the government wants to stimulate the economy, yeah, they want to grow it. What can they do? They must spend. So they can use their money to grow the economy, build schools, create hospitals, fix roads. Can you see how that will create a ripple effect for us increasing the economy? Or if it's going too well, no, 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 we're going to keep some of our money back. We're going to save it or just I don't know what they do with it, but they're not going to spend it. So that's the two options we have when we refer to the fiscal policy. But what can they also do? Almost this fiscal policy on steroids. They can use the two together. So, OK, in my mind, South Africa is not performing very well. We need to do something about the unemployment. So maybe the government should decrease tax. OK, that'll increase the economy. Yes, ma'am, you're right. And spend all the government's money. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So it's a double whammy almost. OK, the opposite is also true. If the government wants to dampen the economy, 
Can you hear I'm using that word quite often because that's a, almost a hot word they're using? If they want to shrink the economy, they must increase Mrs. Dreyer's tax, so I have less money, and they must not spend as much money. So, guys and girls, when you hear the word fiscal policy, you think tax government spending, and they can use that to increase or decrease the economy. I want to ask you, when you get to your final paper at the end of the year, read what they're asking. Sometimes the learners see, oh, fiscal policy, and they're so much scared. You don't have to be scared. They probably will ask you something in the line of, the economy is not performing well. How can the government use the fiscal policy to stimulate growth. I'm going to repeat that. The economy is not doing well. How can the government use the fiscal policy to stimulate growth? So your brain must tell you, fiscal, tax, government spending. What do we want to do? Grow. How do we grow? Decrease tax, increase government spending. Boom, that's your answer. Eight marks in the bag. Okay, moving on. I'm taking a lot of time. Monetary policy. So, I mean, when you hear the word monetary policy, I think of money. That's it. We are using money to decrease or increase or decrease the economy. So, here's a lacquer um, little abbreviation money, income. It sounds like income. So, each are you okay? Each one of the letters represents one of these words. So we can use interest rate, cash reserve, open market transactions, or moral suasion or moral persuasion, either or. And all four of these instruments we either use to increase the economy or decrease the economy. I'm quickly going to run through this. I'm not going to spend as much time on this as the fiscal interest rate. OK, think about it. They're going to increase interest rate. That means my money that I'm borrowing from the bank is now more expensive. So I have less money in my pocket. If they increase the interest rate, people want to save more. So they're taking even more money out of the economy. So we are shrinking it. Um, Open market transactions. Either the government buys back bonds or they sell bonds. So they are taking money or putting money into circulation. Cash reserve requirement. That's almost um, that's almost like a little safety net the South African uh, Reserve Bank puts into play. So for every one rand a commercial bank borrows to someone, they must have a certain percentage saved in the South African Reserve Bank. So if they increase the cash reserve requirement, they are taking money out of circulation, i.e. they are shrinking the economy. If they decrease the cash reserve requirement, good, then we can lend money to more people. So there's more money in circulation. And the last one, moral suasion or moral persuasion, I mean, sometimes there's a learner in my class and they haven't done their homework. Then I, then I say, hi, my child, no, this is not the behavior I expect of you. Please, will you do your homework for tomorrow? So I'm not giving them detention or phoning their parents or whatever. I'm almost playing on their heartstrings, if I can call it that. And that's what the South African Reserve Bank can also do. So they can maybe tell the APSAs and the F&Bs and Capitec, what we call the commercial banks. They can go into discussion with them and say, hey guys, um, please maybe be a little more lenient when you borrow out money, which will mean they put more money in circulation or the other way around. Okay, so this is something I've seen in the past is where they, they ask this work um, in your middle order to higher order question. They want you to, to think a little bit for yourself. But okay, we've touched on that. Let's go on. Quick, quick, quick. That's all that. And here we are at the 
this part that is a possible essay question. But now I have told you that this was an essay question last year, so they won't ask it again this year. But that does not mean, ne, I, 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 I don't hear what I'm not saying. You can't leave this out. You must still understand it. These very nice eight mark questions that they can ask in here, or maybe even a, um, a data response question. So don't not study this. But the economic paradigm, a paradigm means something has two sides. I almost want to say um, a type of cause and effect. You can't just focus on the one side and, and, and don't think that there won't be a reaction. OK, I want to take you to this little graph over here. Because this explains the economic paradigm to me very, very well. Go back to grade nine where we did what we called the price theory. I don't know if you can remember in EMS or the law of supply and demand, whatever you want to call it. And the law is the following. If stuff is cheap, excuse the, I mean the layman term that I'm using. I just want you to understand. If something is cheap or unspecial, think of Black Friday. People want more. OK, so as soon as the price drop, people tend to demand more. OK, but here's what happened. If we demand more. Of something, we create a. Um, a trend, um, I don't know what you want to call it. There's a. There's a, 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 a vibe in the market. So now the suppliers just sell it at a higher price. Have you seen that? I mean, it's true. We see it in our day to day lives. Something that people want very badly. Uh, they are willing to pay more for it. So. What the economic paradigm is, we can't just focus on demand and think demand will not increase the price because the theory is as soon as we demand more the price automatically goes up so let me just zoom into this little picture here so let's start with our initial demand curve and our initial supply curve so this is straightforward grade nine where the supply and the demand meet that is point C, and that is what we call equilibrium. This is where both parties are happy, okay? We are willing to pay price level P, and we demand quantity level Q. Okay, now oh, what happens? All of a sudden, the government says nobody have to pay any tax for the rest of 2022. Woo, party. What's going to happen? You and I have more money, so we will demand more. It doesn't matter if you're going to save some of it. You're definitely going to spend some of it. We just covered that in the first topic. We have a marginal propensity to consume and we have a marginal propensity to save. It's in our DNA. So check what happens here. Because we now have more money, the demand curve jumps to the right, meaning we are demanding more because we now have more money. Forget about this curve for a moment and see what happens now. Do you see our new equilibrium is there at point F? Can you see if we don't change anything about supply? What happens to price? If we had to draw a line there, our price level will increase. So this is what we call the economic paradigm. If we only focus on demand, we will cut off our own throats 
and cause inflation. We will cause the prices to rise. So it is important that when we focus on demand, we should also focus on supply. So check what happens. Our demand curve jumps to the right, meaning you and I, the consumers, we're demanding more. So now we've got the more expensive price, but now the suppliers supply more. So the curve jumps to the right. So look what happens. As soon as there's a, a, a larger supply in the market, the price gets pushed down. But check what happens here, guys. This is amazing. So at the same price level, due to these two curves jumping, we now have a output of Q1. So we are producing more at the same level. So the economy can grow without inflation taking place. So we want the economic paradigm. Paradigm, the coin has two sides. There's a demand and a supply side, and we must focus on both of them. What I've seen in the past is that learners think when they hear economic paradigm, they want to speak about the monetary and the fiscal policy. Why? Because that's the policies we can use to stimulate demand. That's true. But you just saw if we only focus on demand, inflation will take place. So learners, this to me is a very nice eight mark question explain to the marker if uh, what happens if we only focus on demand side policies so we're going to demand 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 and there's no supply so there's going to be a shortage of goods which will lead to more expensive goods okay so if we go on so this is the whole thing yeah but look at this. This is also so interesting. And the, the children, yeah, they love to actually understand this. So this is now still part of demand. Okay, so pause for a moment. Think about it logically. What happens if we have jobs? If we are employed? That means we are earning a salary <laughs> what did we just say what happens if we have money we spend it but that means we demand so there is a definite relationship a link between having a job and inflation don't look at the graph just think about it for a moment if more people have jobs, meaning unemployment is decreasing, what will happen to inflation? Okay, inflation will increase because we just saw if more people have jobs, more people spend, more demand leads to higher prices. And what is inflation, guys? Inflation is higher prices. So, we explain this relationship between unemployment and inflation by using the Phillips curve. So, I am a visual learner and I need to make stories in my mind. So, how do I remember that the Phillips curve is about employment or unemployment for that matter i have a little sentence philip doesn't have a job <laughs> so that's why philip is linked to unemployment um because the other curve that's got the name is the laffer curve and the kids get confused so have the write that little sentence down philip doesn't have a job and then you will remember Philip is linked to unemployment. What do I want to show you? I want to show you the lower unemployment, the more the inflation. So let's prove it. Forget about this one. Let's look at the original curve. Check here. Here we have inflation. It's going from 0 to 10. 
and here we have unemployment from 0 to 14. So, if unemployment, check there, is 14%, so 14% of this country does not have a job, inflation is zero. That makes sense, okay? So there is a lot of people that don't have a job, so they can't spend money, so they don't demand goods, so they're keeping the inflation zero. Let's take price level or point B, not price level, point B. So now we are moving to unemployment being 10%. So unemployment has decreased. This means more people now have jobs. What do you know is happening? This 4% people, what are they doing? They are buying stuff. They're going to a restaurant and celebrating, okay? So, because they now demand, look what's happening to inflation. Inflation is increasing. Let's take it further. Let's take it to point C. Check here. More people are now employed. Unemployment decreased to 8%. Look what's happening to inflation. It's going up even more because there's more people now spending money. Can you see that a government in a perfect world, which we don't live in, but a theory, that a government actually prefers some unemployment? If you look at North America, USA, they have unemployment of around 2% and they keep it like that because that's one of the tools they use to keep inflation stable, if we can call it that. So, learners, this is why we use this in the, or we speak about it in the economic paradigm because we can't just focus on employment. Because if we just focus on employment without upping the supply, inflation will take place. This, in my mind, is another eight mark question. This is a point four or a point five question that they definitely can ask you. They also like to ask in your monkey puzzle questions, um, what curve or which curve is used to illustrate the relationship between unemployment and inflation. And then you must know, who is it? Philip, Philip Etiverki. Philip doesn't have a job. Okay, let's go on. Um, so yeah, in, in the rest of this little chapter, they, we've spoken about demand. Yes, we can use monetary and fiscal policy to focus on creating demand. But now what can we do to focus on supply? Because we can't just focus on demand. It is a double whammy. We need to do it together. So here is how we can focus on supply. OK, so I'm not going to go through that. Here is another um, graph explaining the um, inflation. And here we get to 2.5. 2.5, discuss in detail. Guys, work this out as a possible long question. The different types of indicators the length of a cycle, the amplitude, trend, extrapolation, moving averages, etc. This is a possible long question. OK. So um, I just quickly want to stop there and, and just. I like to give <laughs> almost I always say to the learners, let's pause economics for a moment and have a language lesson, lesson an English lesson. What is an indicator? An indicator? In Afrikaans, is a flikkerlig, nee? A person drives in a car in front of you and puts on its indicator. They indicate that they're going to turn left or they indicate that they're going to turn right, okay? Back to economics, moving away from the language. We want to see, we want to be able to forecast, to predict what is going to happen in this economy. I know I refer a lot to my learners in my class, um, but I mean, this is part of my day to day, and I just want to draw you this little picture. 
So uh, this year was the first time in two years that our school could have a senior ball where our grade 10s, 11s and 12 dress up a little and they could come and dance the evening year at school. So we actually, um, it is a Friday evening and um, we finished school that day at one o'clock. Um, not because of the senior ball, some other reason, but we finished at one o'clock. We normally leave at half past two on a Friday. So when I was teaching my learners this lesson about indicators and forecasting, I told them the following. I am predicting, I am forecasting that on Friday, only 50% of my senior learners will be at school. No, ma'am, why do you say that? You can't say that. <laughs> and Friday came and half of my class was empty. Why? Because I can use information from the past to predict the future. I've been teaching 10 years at Tigerberg High School and I know the way the learners operate. They wanted to do their hair and paint their nails and do their makeup so they didn't come to school. And this is indicators, children. We use these different indicators to determine um, what is going to happen in our economy. OK, so this is what you look at here. This is straightforward studying work, study, study, study. And that is business cycles in a nutshell. So let's move to the questions that Mr. Green has so kindly um, created for us. Guys, this is the best type of practice you can get because this is from past papers. There's only so many ways they can ask these questions. Eh? So practice, practice, practice. Study the work and then you work out old papers. OK, quick, quick. Um, so. I know I want to um, spend time and maybe give you time to to work out the questions, but the thing is, um, because I'm taking so long in teaching the lessons, it's it's quite difficult for me to now give you a chance to work it out beforehand. So my suggestion is we're going to talk through it. You're going to make notes, but what can you do? You can go and re redo it at home, practice it. Ask your teacher in class, sir, I'm stuck. Can you just maybe help me? What did Mrs. Dreyer say here? OK, so let's start with this. Here we see business cycle. We've got our economic activities. We've got our time and year of very clear ups and downs. So without looking at the notes and the questions, you can see we have peak, peak, trial, trial. This whole A, B, C scenario, this whole line is a contraction, a downswing. This C, D, E, upswing, um, expansion, it's going good with us. So let's see what are the questions. So the first thing, shortly describe a business cycle. So what do you need to know? Three things, ups and downs. What type of ups and downs? Successive ups and downs. Of what? Of how we eat chocolates? No, successive ups and downs of economic activity. Boom, two marks done and dusted in the bag. So here's the answer. There we go. Successive periods of increasing, decreasing. You can say ups and downs of economic activities. If you just say successive periods of increasing and decreasing, that doesn't mean anything. You must say of what? Economic activities. OK, so now they want us to identify a downturn. So let's just look here. A downturn. At what point is it not going well with our economy? Can you see? A, B, C, definitely a downturn, downhill, down the drain. No, it's not going good. Or it can also be E, F, G. That's another downturn. Both of them, downhill, not going well. 
So you could either say um, ABC or EFG, same thing. Then they wanted you to identify any trowel. So just check it here, trowel, trowel, lowest point in this economy. Boys and girls, can you see that this only counts one mark? And the reason for that is it is a lower order question. This is grade 10 work. You must be able to immediately spot peak trowel. Again, draw the table, I'll draw the graph, stick it somewhere and look at it over and over again. OK, let's move on. Name two exogenous factors that give rise to a business cycle. You know what they're saying? Name any two factors from the outside, exogenous, that leads to these big fluctuations. Why do we have these ups and downs? Why isn't it just a straight line? Because the government is not doing their work or there's more or less money in supply. Okay? Shocks, technology. I don't want to spend time on this. This you must study, 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 study. So perhaps if I'm going too fast, and you would like the memorandums of these questions, we can ask um, Mr. Green, maybe you can just afterwards send him a quick email and we can send it to you so you can um, you can give it to the learners in class. I would rather just, yeah, let's talk through it so that the learners understand where this is coming from. Okay, 1.4. I don't know why, but they love this question. They, every year for the past few years, I've seen this question being asked. What, is, what do we call the method of predicting the future? Ne? What? Name the method of predicting future business cycles based on the patterns of previous ones. And that is extrapolation. So that story I just told you about my learners not coming to school on the Friday of senior ball, that is extrapolation. I'm using information from the past to predict the future, and I prove the future. Let's put it in economics. Past data has shown us if the government decreases tax, people spend more. Okay? So we can prove it. Economics is a science, guys. What a wonderful science. We can, we can predict that if the government increases the interest rate, people will borrow less money. We can predict that. We know this is the pattern people have followed in the past and will most probably follow in the future. Enough of that. Please study this. Section A, your monkey puzzles, column A, column B, one word for they love this. OK, moving on. Study the following cartoon about the reasons for business cycles and answer the question that follow. So here is a little maniki, a little man riding a bicycle to the end. And it says here at the top explanation one. OK. And then explanation two. Shame, it looks like an obstacle course. Here's some, here's the man on the bike. Here's some rocks that you must cross. Here's a bridge. Here's water. Here's some weather conditions, a leather, he, a ladder he must climb. And foytoch here at the end, there's the end line. So, now they ask you in number 2.1. Explain the above cartoon in your own words. Learners, please don't write anything about an obstacle course or a man on a bicycle or whatever. This is economics, so we must, we must link it to economic activities. So yes, you may refer to the bicycle, maybe saying that this is the consumer or this is the economy or whatever you want to say, but you can't use the cartoon literally. You must link it to economics. Okay, so let's see what they say. 
Firstly, explanation one indicates the exogenous explanation where the economy is inherent stable. So the exogenous people, they feel the economy is stable. We don't have these big ups and downs. They feel that it's shocks from the outside that causes these ups and downs. So explanation two indicates that it is factors from the inside, in the genus, and we are inherent stable. I want to go as far as maybe, um, yeah, speaking about the weather patterns, yeah, ne? stuff from the outside, or yeah, maybe referring to structural changes. I'm going to say this again. When we do training, at the end of the year, before we mark all the grade 12 economic paper for the Western Cape, our chief says the following sentence, as long as it makes economic sense. So can I tell you, we sit with a question paper next to us and read what the learner write. So this is not necessarily the only answer, guys. If you can link it to economics, please do so. Okay, moving on. 2.2, name two factors that will cause increases and decreases in explanation two. So they are just referring to the endogenous um, um, explanation. So in your notes, you can copy and paste two of the inside factors that causes these ups and downs. Okay, everybody all right? Moving on. Which tendency, which trend, that's another word for tendency, which trend occur in both explanation one and two? Where's this man going? Check though. He's going up, guys. Even if he went here through a very low point and another low point, he ends up higher than he started. And that's the same with economy. We have a natural positive growth line. I tell my learners, think about it, guys. Our economy will, while the world's economy will continue to grow as long as more people are born than more people die. So that's just one element. So if more people are born, we demand more. So there is a natural growth taking place in the economies of the world. Okay, that's question 2.3. Just check if everybody's all right. Okay. So study the graph below and answer the questions that follow. Now, I know I have been um, teaching this for many moons. Um, so my brain knows they are speaking about inflation and the economic paradigm. I can see this immediately because what's happening here? First of all, demand increases, which leads to a new price level of price level A. Can you see it? But now, people or the producers or the government or whoever, they also focus on the supply curve. So they supply more, supply jumps to the right. We are now producing more at the same price level. And that is what we want. We can't just focus on demand without focusing on supply. Because if we just focus on demand, it will lead to inflation. Let's see what they want. What is illustrated in the graph above? OK, so they say demand and supply side policies. Again, can I tell you if you wrote something there in the line of um, economic paradigm or inflation um, due to only focusing on the demand side, I would definitely, if you in my class, would read it, and if it makes sense, I would mark it. Okay, at which point will inflation prevail? Sure, that's beautiful English, but it's difficult. 
What does prevail mean? Happen. Where will inflation happen? So, let's see. Where will inflation take place, learners? There. Ne? Because we're just demanding more without supplying more, we will have inflation. But luckily, in this scenario, we have an increase in demand and an increase in supply. So we are producing at equilibrium point C at the same price, but our output will be more. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Briefly describe the term new economic paradigm. Learners, this is where I told the groups from the previous classes. This is the type of thing that you must write on a little flashcard. The same with the definition of a business cycle. Ask your teacher if you don't have paper. Just take a plain white paper, split it into four parts, cut it into smaller pieces and make little cue cards. On the one side, you write a term, new economic paradigm. And on the other side, you write a definition. And you know what? Instead of sitting break times and I don't know what you guys do, Ask a friend that has economics with you. Hey, want to sit with me? Let's test one another uh, five questions quickly. Ne? And this is the type of things you can do with the new economic paradigm, business cycles, all the definitions. OK, anyway, enough of that. So new economic paradigm, it discourages discourage policy makers from using monetary and fiscal policy to fine tune the economy but rather encourages achieving stability through sound long-term policy decisions relating to demand and supply. Take you so, check ya. Yeah. Accept any other relevant response. Children, write this in your own language. So what is the economic paradigm? We can't just focus on demand side policies. We must also focus on supply side policies along with demand side policies. Otherwise, inflation will take place. That's beautiful. OK, 3.4. What would happen to the output if supply did not respond to the change in demand? OK, what would happen to the output if supply did not respond to the change in demand? Sorry, my brain is tired now already. And um, being Afrikaans, I must first translate it in my mind. But what are they asking? So they are asking us, forget about the second supply curve for a moment. If only demand increased, what will happen to our output? So our output would increase. Ne? The supplier will definitely supply more. Why? Because they're getting a higher price. So if you were to, were to draw a little line down there, can you see the quantity is still more, but yeah, it is the most. So the answer is actually very straightforward. It's just output will increase. Quantity will increase. No? Okay, 3.5. How will the government reduce cost of production to stimulate the supply? So this is straightforward study work, but I just quickly, one of my learners in my class, um, he was very upset about this because he said, how can you supply more with the same resources? How can we do more with the same things? So we can be more efficient. Um, there's certain things we can do. So let's think about it for a moment. Say, for example, we are exporting something. You should not know by now that the government taxes us on that. So say for argument's sake, they ta don't tax us on that. Will we not supply more? Because now we have to pay that money for taxes instead of supplying more. So the government can reduce their costing their red tape, their inefficiencies, maybe giving us a subsidy even, so that we can supply more with the same 
with the same um, resources. I want to put it in a in a simple example. So in my class, I have um, almost forty learners for economics grade twelve. How can I be? How can I supply more? Well, just put in more tables. So it's the same resource. It's the same one teacher. It's the, I'm I'm only the one teacher being paid the salary but I am supplying to more learners. I hope that makes sense. Okay, moving on. Okay, so this, okay, now we're gonna skip that one. We are moving to this one because I see there's no questions there. Okay, mm -hmm. study the graph below and answer the questions. Okay, so we see the heading is the new economic paradigm. And we see here on the side, it's uh, it's marked as inflation. And here we see unemployment. Who doesn't have a job? Philip. This is a Phillips curve. So what's the theory here, guys? The lower the unemployment, the higher inflation. The lower the unemployment, the higher inflation. I want to say it the other way around as well. So the more employed people, the more inflation. Because the more people that work, the more money in circulation. The more money being spent, nay? more money being spent leads to a bigger demand. Bigger demand leads to inflation. That is the long and the short. So let's see what they ask here. Okay, provide a name for the graph. We know the Phillips curve. Yes, we've got that. What is the original natural rate of unemployment in the graph above? Okay, so let's check here. What is the natural rate of unemployment? So what do they mean by natural? How many people must be unemployed for infl inflation to be zero? And that is there because we are looking at the original. Let me test you. What will be the natural unemployment rate for PC1, for the PC1 curve? Can you see? It's there by point D. So I will guess it at around 9%. That will be the natural unemployment rate for PC1. So that means the natural unemployment rate is where inflation is zero. Okay, can you see this is a repetition, guys? They love this. The term new economic paradigm. I'm not going to spend time on that. You must study that. Explain how the government can use its fiscal policy. Pause. Guys, what do you think when you see the word fiscal? You should know tax, government spending. Can I speak about interest rates? No, interest rate is monetary policy. So explain how the government can use its fiscal policy to speed up the re uh, or speed up the recovery of an economy. What's what is written there, guys? You can say to grow the economy, to increase the economy, to broaden the economy, to make us richer, to make us better. How can we use this fiscal policy? So we can reduce tax, which will lead to us having more money, spending more, producing more, more people employed. Or we can increase government spending, same result. Or we can do the two of them combined. Put this fiscal policy on steroids. Okay. Learners, some technicalities. Okay, so this is only two marks. So you only had to refer to one of the three to get your full marks. But if it's a how question, you can't just tell me reduce tax. When we mark they tell us the learners must qualify their answer. 
always tell me what will happen because I did this. So reducing taxes will give consumers give consumers more money. OK, and companies will expand production. Beautiful. Two marks. OK, moving on. With the aid of a graph, illustrate the effect of demand side and supply side policies in smoothing out business cycles. They want you to draw the economic paradigm. So you start with your grade nine, demand and supply curve. Then you jump your demand curve to the right because demand is increasing. What do you know? We can't just increase demand. We must also increase supply. So I see this mark allocation is four, but in a test or in the exam, this will count eight and you will get four marks for the graph and another four for explaining what is happening here. I'm not going to spend more time on this because I think we have done this quite detailed today. OK, moving on. Ooh, study the graph below and answer the questions that follow. South Africa, and this is our real GDP, our real gross domestic product. So we can immediately see this is real time. This is what actually happened. You know what's interesting? Sure, this teacher Dreyer just said a few minutes ago that the economy will always grow. What's happening here? Look at this little dotted line over here. What's happening? This is a downward slope. So since 2000, up until 2015, we can see South Africa has a downward growth trend. Good. I want to show you something that I've seen in the past two years that they ask. Um, in your data response, the first two questions are lower order. Everybody should be able to answer that in the question paper. And they have asked in the past paper, who publishes this information? But can you see here at the bottom, it says the source. So where did we get this from? It says there, the South African Reserve Bank. So. If you have a if you have a question on a data response, don't misread that. Sometimes there's very there's a lot of information on this. OK, so let's see what they are asking. What was the real GDP growth in 2009? So they just testing. Can you read a graph? So let's go to 2009. And they are very kind. They are printing it there. It is minus 1,5%. So we had a decline in negative growth. Identify the period, they wanted the years, when the longest business cycle can be observed. Okay, so pause. A business cycle is either from peak to peak or trough to trough for a full business cycle to take place. So we can very clearly see we want it from a um, expansion right through a contraction. So there's a trial and there's a trial. And that was the longest amount of years. That business cycle took us six years. So for one mark from 2003 to 2009. By now, you should be able to give me this definition in your sleep. If I wake you up in the middle of the night and say, yay, what's the definition of gross domestic product? Final goods and services, man, produced within the borders of a country. This is one of your flashcards, guys. I can't explain this. I can. 
but <laughs> not at this point anymore. You must study this. OK. Explain the underlying forces of the amplitude in 2009. Oh, this is difficult English. What do they want? They want to know why is this movement? Né? Why is it so extreme? Can you see it's the most extreme of the ups and downs? That is what amplitude means. Um, so it says a large amplitude during the downswing demonstrates weak underlying forces. We are just, yeah, it's not going well. There were extreme changes. We can see that because that um, jump is so extreme. The, we have slumped very sharply, indicating weak economic forces, but this only counts four marks, so the first two should be enough. I want to focus on this extreme. Something extreme happened in 2009. I can tell you, I don't want to bore you with it, but it's when the banks of America or the bank in America crashed and we had our first proper recession. I remember this very clearly because um, I was still in the private sector and a thousand people in my office got retrenched. So this was a very, very extreme change. It changes. It reminds me of COVID, guys. That's an extreme change that took place that affected the economy. I'm thinking of the war that's going on. That is extreme changes taking place. Anyway, moving on. How can tax be used to reverse the downward trend in an economy? Why are they asking this so difficult? What are they asking? Explain how we can use tax to grow the economy. What do you know? We want to give the consumer more money. How do we give them more money? We decrease our tax. Make the tax less so the consumer have more money. They will spend more. The economy will grow. Oh, I can almost see South Africa's in trouble here. They are on a down, a down yield. Can you see? It looks like... It looks like I want to say zoom out there in the truck. I can't see. I have to zoom in. OK, let's see. The heading economic downturn. Our economy is in trouble. I can see that trouble ahead. They've gone through the barriers. They are in big trouble. So the truck is called the South African economy because that's where we're heading. And then this little man says, yeah, I think it's Zuma. We are very close to a recession. Duh. And then it says, why? Because the exchange rate is 14 rand for a dollar. Inflation is high. It's outside our target of 3 to 6%. And we only have 0,8% growth. Okay. So. Identify two economic indicators in the cartoon. So can you see they linking some of the other topic with this? Um, maybe you won't um, necessarily um, know this answer yet. We are um, doing that with our social and our economic indicators later in the year, but it's very straightforward. It's one of the three rocks at the bottom. It's either GDP, inflation or exchange rate. OK, 6.2 term recession. This is one of your flashcards. If there's something I've seen the past few years, again, they love recession. You must say two consecutive quarters né? after one another. Two consecutive quarters of what? Negative economic growth. So if we have three months now with a negative growth and the next three months, again, we are in a theoretical recession consecutive two consecutive quarters negative economic growth rate a minus for that matter né? how will the initial stages in an economic downturn influence interest rates sure okay this to me is very open you can um 
you can argue this both ways. You must just argue it properly. OK, so they're saying in the initial stages of a economic downturn. So I just want to take you back here. Just check at a. Uh, um, sorry, guys, I'm jumping around. I'm, I want to show you here in the notes. So they're saying we are now here. And it is the initial we are going into a downturn. What will the interest rates be? OK, so the answer is interest rates will remain high. I agree because they haven't reacted yet. But as we move further on in this downswing, what will the government try and do? Take us out of it. So they will lower the interest rates because we should know by now that is one of the monetary policy. ICAM, remember? monetary policy instruments that they use to get our economy growing. OK, number 6.4. Ooh, now this is a catchy catchy. What can the South African Reserve Bank do to increase growth? So learners, this is now what we call a higher order question. Why? Because when you see South African Reserve Bank, your mind should tell you, OK, it's not the fiscal policy because the South African Reserve Bank uses the monetary policy. Let me just repeat that. The South African Reserve Bank uses the monetary policy. So your brain should tell you now these four instruments. Mrs. Dreyer said, ICAM. Interest rates, cash reserve, um, open market transactions, and moral persuasion. Be careful of just listing them. You must explain to me how can we grow the economy. Interest rates must be decreased. Eh? We can encourage open market transactions. We can, so yeah, they're just referring to the interest rates again. You can speak about the cash reserve amount can be decreased because then there's more money in circulation. We can um, buy back the open market transactions so that there's more money in circulation. Okay. Here's the same thing, guys. It's just asked differently. Study the graph. OK, so we see this is a business cycle. And then discuss how the South African Reserve Bank. OK, so what do you know? Monetary policy. How can they have prevented the business cycle from plunging? Plunging again. It's not going well. What can the South African Reserve Bank do? to get our economy out of this dark hole we are in. So it is going to be a repeat of the previous answer. But I will humor you. South African Reserve Bank, monetary policy. What's the abbreviation? ICAM, interest rate, cash reserve, open market transaction, moral persuasion. Skipping through that one. Check here. Oh, I asked this in the first term for my learners as well. With the aid of the Phillips curve. Pause there. What do you know about Philip? Philip doesn't have a job. So if Philip doesn't have a job, inflation is curbed. But if Philip gets a job, then inflation will also rise. So what are they asking? Use the Phillips curve to explain the relationship between unemployment and inflation. So I'm not going to spend time on explaining the curve again. I just want to show you technicalities. When we have a question like this for eight marks, you can get a maximum of four for the graph because they're not just asking you to draw the graph. They want you to explain it to me. OK, so the next two slides, we have explanations and explanations. And I am going to stop there because I see the next bit of the work 
is the booklet. So I think what we should do for next time, I'm going to make a little note, um, note of it. You must um, complete that question. I just want to see, here's the learner manual. So this is the one that Mr. Um, Green gave you guys. Um, so we have just finished this one. Number eight. I want you for next time to complete the multiple choice questions. So it's from number nine to number 9.6. I want you to do this, number 10. I want you to do number 11 and then have it ready for next time that I see you guys. 